Our speaker is Alfio Quattaroni, and he is one of those speakers where one has to be careful as a chairperson that the introduction doesn't take longer than the whole uh, presentation because there are so many things to report about his accomplishments that I can only uh, list the very few highlights. Alfio is the director of modeling and scientific computing at EPFL Yuzan, but at the same time he's a professor of numerical mathematics at uh, Milano, uh, where he also is the director of the MOX, the institute there. Uh, his scientific work is probably best described by uh, his publications. He's the author of 20 books and has edited several more. Uh, he has more than uh, 200 uh, papers, journal papers, refereed papers. Uh, he's also a fellow of the SIAM um, and the member of the Board of uh, Trustees. He's also a fellow of the European Academy of Sciences. And maybe his most recent accomplishment, he's the supervisor of the student prize winner that we have just awarded the prize recently, right? This was not in any way planned. This has just come out. And I think this also shows his uh, engagement in educating young scientists and then bringing them uh, to, to their best. Um, he will, uh, so we are very happy to have him here. And I remember that in the committee we had this discussion, should we even try to get him? He's so busy. And now he's here. We are really happy to have him. And he will speak uh, about modeling the cardiovascular system. And we are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Uli, for uh, this very nice word. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for, uh, for inviting me here. I'm very proud and happy. Uh, I, I apologize for having changed a little bit my title. Um, so the application would be a bit different than the one that I was, uh, that I've announced. However, the uh, algorithms, the methods, the numerical approaches are basically the same. Uh, so this is more or less the uh, context uh, I would like to address. Uh, I'll be talking about cardiovascular system and trying to set up a model and, uh, and, uh, which is suitable for numerical simulation. So the very first thing that we need are uh, images uh, because we want to start from, ideally, from real patients and building up a uh, model of uh, their uh, uh, cardiovascular or circulatory system, uh, and in particular, a model for uh, their arteries or for the tract of, uh, of, uh, of their arteries. So the very first thing is to start from uh, uh, real uh, uh, clinical images, MRI or CT scan, for instance, and uh, uh, build up after segmentation a, a geometrical uh, a model, a solid model for the artery. And at that stage, uh, you can set up a grid on the surface of the artery and then on uh, uh, the old uh, lumen, which is a volumetric grid. Uh, this is the very first step. This is the preprocessing. The second step is to uh, set up the mathematical model. And here there are several different issues. One is... Uh, about the rheology of blood, which kind of fluid is it, how can we characterize the properties of the arterial vessels, uh, how can we set up a model which is suitable for uh, uh, accounting for the uh, uh, triple field in, uh, in the heart, the electrical, the mechanical, and the, and the, and the fluid field. Then there are several biochemical processes, processes in our body, and uh, one of those is drug release from stents, for instance, that I'll be sure to address in my talk. And, uh, of course, there is a very big area that I'm not going to touch here, uh, only marginally, actually, uh, is about the uncertainty. Uh, how uh, can you make sure that we have the right parameters, that we have the right data? And uh, there is a lot of variability, which is uh, intrinsic to the uh, uh, acquisition of images from one side, but also intrinsic to the fact that we are talking about biological structures that change their attitude according to, for instance, the metabolic response. So it's very hard. It's not like simulating, say, a uh, uh, solid mechanics problem or probably in aerodynamics where you have uh, a body, uh, an airplane, for instance, and, uh, and, of course, you know the basic physical laws. The third is, of course, setting up uh, a, a tool for, uh, uh, for, uh, for the computation. Uh, now uh, you need uh, suitable uh, numerical approximation methods in space and time. Uh, you, you need uh, a parallel solution algorithm because the problem very often is very, is very large. And then, uh, uh, hopefully, you need to set up uh, uh, strategies for model reduction because the problem is so complicated that uh, it's sometimes very difficult to address it by brute mathematical force, I would say. Uh, the fourth point is uh, verification and validation. Uh, do we work, have, you, have we worked correctly? Can we check that our results are uh, accurate or are meaningful at all? 
And uh, uh, of course, uh, here the problem is that there are very few uh, benchmarks. Uh, uh, there are, you can use in vitro experiments, uh, you can use in vivo models, but in that case, you need to make sure that the data are, are uh, the patient data are the right ones. And finally, there is an ample set of possible clinical applications. Uh, we want to use these approaches to uh, understand, better understand the physiological conditions uh, of the circulatory system, but also to uh, uh, try to uh, predict the uh, on-rise of uh, possible pathologies and, uh, and, and the follow-up, and also uh, to uh, uh, address issues related with surgery. How can we uh, set up tools to predict the outcome of different surgical treatments, for instance? And, uh, and eventually uh, trying to uh, uh, use uh, mathematics to optimize uh, medical devices. Say. So this is uh, uh, the, the global picture. Of course, I'm not going to address all these points uh, because it would take for forever, but I will give some uh, uh, hints of all these points, actually, uh, in a very schematic way. Uh, from images to grid, uh, there are several possible ways to get images. Uh, here is a 3D uh, magnetic resonance image. Uh, from, uh, from, a, from a real patient. Uh, this is the aortic arch. Now, uh, after uh, uh, um, segmentation, uh, you can end up with uh, a, a computational domain, which is this red one. And the computational domain is the one that you are actually going to use for solving your partial differential equation. Once you have the computational domain, uh, before solving your equation, you need a grid. So you need to set up a, a superficial grid and then, and then uh, a volumetric grid, say. Um, you may also uh, have available 4D medical images, which means uh, images in space and time. Uh, today, uh, uh, you can get uh, images for every, uh, I would say, one uh, tenth of a second. So basically, you have 10 different images uh, for every heartbeat, roughly speaking. Um, now, once you have these images, uh, this is the aortic arch again. Uh, you can, uh, again, through vessel cementation and surface registration, I will address very shortly this point uh, later on, uh, you can have in this case, uh, you see um, uh, the uh, uh, normalized uh, displacement um, of uh, uh, this uh, um, AAA, which is aneurysm in the abdominal aorta. So this is from images. Uh, you have this information, and you can use this information in many possible ways, as a data for your computation, but also as a tool to register or to control the quality of your, of your solution, actually. Um, this is the same picture as before. This is the numerical simulation of uh, uh, this uh, uh, part of the uh, circulatory system. Uh, you see the impinging jet here, and uh, you can check, and here are the watch stresses, and you can actually see that and, uh, and find the posteriori that the highest uh, jet incidence is that in which uh, the uh, maximum uh, uh, displacement occur on, uh, on, on the real data. So this is a kind of qualitative um, verification that uh, you are actually getting the right, numerical, the right results from your numerical simulation. Um, the... Uh, Uh, the uh, the um, preliminary set of data that you get from clinical images, as I said before, uh, should also be used to uh, set up your geometric model and then your grid. Now, it's very important to have the right grid, to have a good quality grid. Otherwise, the results could be very seriously... Uh, I don't see the point here anymore. Uh, let me see if... Uh, you have another laser pointer, please? Sorry, Fred. Uh, all right. So the battery's over right now. <laughs> uh, so you can see two different grids. Uh, one is, thanks, thank you. Uh, one is a, a boundary layer grid near the endothelium uh, um, uh, membrane, and the other is not. And uh, as you shall see, uh, the results that you have here are completely different, or are substantially different, say. This is the boundary layer grid, so the grid with uh, a boundary layer uh, of uh, elements uh, 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 near the endothelium interface, and this is the one without the boundary layer. Uh, this is the map of the shear stresses. You see quantitatively that the results that you get are really very, very different. So uh, having a good quality grid is very important uh, to start your uh, uh, problem, actually. Now comes the model. 
uh, how do you model blood flow? Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, it depends on uh, where you're looking uh, to your solution. I mean, the circulatory system is made of uh, uh, billions of uh, uh, small capillaries and, uh, and, and thousands of uh, medium-sized vessels and uh, hundreds of large vessels. Uh, now, if uh, you are looking for large vessels like the uh, carotid artery, which is uh, here in, in our neck, we have two carotid arteries actually, and uh, here is the bifurcation of the carotid artery, uh, here is the bifurcation, here is, this is the real data. Uh, this is a very important place because uh, past the bifurcation, you might have a narrowing of the artery, a, 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 an occlusion of the artery. So it's very important to have a right simulation of this specific part of the cardiovascular, si cardiovascular system. So this is uh, perhaps the easiest type of computation you can set up in this context. Uh, we are just using Navier-Stokes equations for laminar flows, uh, for Newtonian fluids, uh, with a constant viscosity then, uh, in this carotid artery with, uh, with the rigid walls. And uh, here is an heartbeat. You see, this is the systolic peak and this is the diastolic peak. This is one physical second. And that's the way the velocity profile behaves in, uh, in the different cross-section of, uh, of the carotid artery, say. So this is nothing but Navistos equations, uh, classical Navistos equation for incompressible viscous Newtonian fluids. The tricky point is how to get the boundary conditions at the inflow, at the, at the inflow here and at the outflow. And this is uh, an issue I will be uh, uh, considering again uh, later on because it's uh, very, very critical for this type of simulation. Um, now, uh, indeed, our vessels are deforming. They are not rigid. So you need to uh, uh, model the vessels called vessel compliance. The fact that under the action of the heartbeat, of the, uh, uh, under the gradient of pressure, the vessel deform. Uh, how do you model that? Uh, well, uh, as, as you certainly know, in continuum mechanics, you have at least a couple of possible uh, a, pos a couple of possible uh, alternatives uh, to describe your uh, 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 equations. One is the Eulerian context and the other is the, uh, the Lagrangian context. In, uh, well, here, uh, in fact, we use a kind of hybrid approach, which is the so-called ALE. ALE stands for Arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian. You are, we are mix mixing up in a suitable way the uh, Lagrangian and the Eulerian. Uh, why that? Because we are interested in simulating, uh, this is, of course, a very simplified context, uh, uh, arteries where you have the blood, the lumen, this is omega f of t, f stands for fluid, t stands for time, and then you have the gray part which models the uh, uh, presence of uh, the solid structure, the, the vessel wall. Uh, now, uh, the vessel wall deform, as we have seen before, so, before, so this upper, these are vertical cross section of the artery. So this, the upper part and the lower part are actually deforming. They are moving on the time, uh, along the time. Uh, whereas the vertical uh, boundaries are kept fixed. And this is a, a mathematical artifact. You want to simulate that specific part of the artery. So this is uh, the vertical ones are artificial boundaries, while the horizontal ones are real boundaries. So we want to describe this computational domain to retrieve it at every time by a suitable map that we call the ALE map uh, from a reference domain at time zero, say. So this AT is neither Lagrangian nor Eulerian, say. And uh, uh, when you use this ALE map and you take derivative according to the ALE map of a certain Q quantity, say, it could be the density the, uh, or the velocity or the pressure, then the time derivative according to this ALE approach is the classical Eulerian derivative plus an extra term. This extra term is the gradient of Q times W, uh, scalar W, and W is the rate of deformation of this map. So W is the time derivative of AT, say. In, in practical terms, uh, W is uh, indeed the rate of deformation of the finite element or the finite volume or the finite difference grid that we're actually using. So that, that W is the time derivative of this uh, um, of the displacement of, of the grid. And that's important because by so doing, you can compute the uh, inertial terms uh, always with respect to the same uh, reference frame, which is the initial one. Uh, the other um, classical formula that is important here is the so-called Reynolds transport theorem, uh, which uh, uh, allows us to take the derivative of a given quantity uh, uh, of, the, of the average of a given quantity over a domain that changes in time uh, and bringing this derivative um, 
and the design of the integral, you take the partial derivative with respect to the uh, ALE map, plus this extra term, which is F times uh, divergence of W. Now, if you express this ALE derivative uh, using the previous formula in terms of the classical Eulerian derivative, this is what you get. So you take the derivative of an average quantity, and this is the, the average of this uh, modified quantity. And here is where the W, uh, the rate of deformation of the grid, enters in the scheme. And here is the uh, complete set of equations that we're actually going to solve. It's made of three pieces. There are three fields. The intermediate one is the fluid field. This is the, these are the Navier-Stokes equations where the momentum equation has been written in this ALE uh, frame of reference. So this is the classical momentum equation for Navier-Stokes uh, in the ALE frame of reference. This is why the convective term has been modified by the uh, subtraction of this W, say. This is the continuity equation. Then you have an equation for the deformable structure. This is a more or less classical elastodynamic set of equations for a solid body. Uh, you have the red conditions, which are the coupling conditions. The two sets are coupled together. Uh, you have the continuity of the velocity field at the endothelium interface, and you have the equilibration of stresses. Uh, it's a bit complicated, this writing, because you have to account for the fact that the structure is in a Lagrangian framework and, uh, and the fluid is in the ALE framework, say. So you have to make sure that this equality takes care, take care, um, are valid on the same reference domain. Um, and then you have a third field, which is the geometry. The lumen changes because of the deformation of the arteries. So you have to retrieve at every time step the actual uh, form of the lumen, which is omega f of t, and uh, we'll see that this requires the solution of an extra uh, partial differential equation. So this is the uh, set of equations uh, that we want to solve, and here is just a, a simplified form of these equations. Um, we have three fields, as I was saying before, the fluid field, the, so the solid field, and the geometric field. The fluid field is the set of Navier-Stokes equations. They depend on the fluid variable uf, on the deformation of the structure ds, and on the deformation of the, uh, of the fluid part, which is basically the uh, deformation of the grid. Then you have the surface, uh, which is actually the solid structure. It depends on uh, the deformation. Uh, this is the unknown for a given set of uh, fluid variables, uf. And finally, you have g, uh, which is the uh, geometry problem. Uh, g basically means that uh, uh, you should be able to retrieve the new grid, the formed grid, as a function of the deformation of the point on the, on the surface. Uh, it's a Dirichlet problem for the Laplace equation or for the elasticity equation that you have to solve. It's an extra equation that is coupled with the previous ones. Um, there might be uh, an interest here to consider uh, the so-called surface registration technique, and this is uh, uh, borrowed from a word that uh, Professor Veneziani uh, is, uh, in his group is carrying out at Emory University. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, in, in very rough terms, the issue here is that from images that are taking a different instance, say, roughly speaking, we have 10 different images for every heartbeat, uh, uh, you may want to compute a map that is capable of retrieving one image from the previous one. So you have a map, which depends on time, that is capable of describing uh, all this uh, uh, evolution of, uh, the evolution of all these uh, images, say. Now, if you would have this map, uh, ideally, you should know uh, over the time, uh, in a continuous manner, the uh, evolution of the inner part of uh, the uh, solid uh, structure, which means the endothelium. Now, if you know the endothelium, uh, the position of the endothelium, then uh, you might be able to solve uh, your fluid equation with this, uh, uh, with this uh, surface prescribed. So the surface now is becoming a data. It's no longer an unknown as in the fluid structure interaction problem that we have seen before. It's a data. It's a boundary data which is, changes, which is changing in time. So this is a way you can use surface registration to uh, uh, solve uh, uh, the problem only in the fluid part, in the fluid component. So this is a kind of uh, reduction of the complexity because you have no longer a coupled problem, you have a decoupled problem only for the fluid, say. But of course, you need to have a high-quality uh, surface registration uh, technique. 
Um, uh, there is another way you can use uh, surface registration. And again, I'm, I'm borrowing here a, a, an approach that was developed by, by Alessandro. Uh, it's uh, using a, a variational um, a data simulation approach. Instead of uh, using, say, Kalman filters, uh, here you solve a control problem in which uh, 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 you want to uh, make sure that at every time, uh, the measured displacement of the artery in the fluid structure interaction problem uh, minus uh, the, uh, this is what you get from your numerical simulation, minus what you get from measures, uh, this is minimized. And uh, it's a control problem, then you need to have a control variable. And the control variable is uh, up to uh, your choice. And one possibility is to uh, use this uh, uh, minimization process uh, uh, to uh, better compute the elastic properties of the vessel. So that's another way uh, you can use uh, uh, surface registration. And this is a, a data simulation uh, procedure just like as the one that you use for uh, weather forecast, for instance. Uh, if you have four-dimensional data, if you have volumetric data, like in this case, uh, the, now you have uh, the velocity vectors uh, that are extracted from this uh, 4D MRI, then you can use these velocity vectors as uh, another uh, way to uh, drive your computation toward uh, a more accurate solution by comparing uh, uh, these extractive velocity vectors with those that uh, you have been computing uh, by your uh, fluid structure interaction, interaction problem. Uh, so you see the interplay between uh, uh, the data and, uh, and, and the model. It could take many different forms. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the main driving force, actually the driving force of the circulation is heart. And uh, heart, it's, uh, um, uh, of course, is a very complex machine. And uh, here is just a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, over, oversimplified uh, uh, picture. Uh, you have the electrical signal that dictates, dictates the contraction of the heart muscle. Uh, the strain of the top tissue from his hand uh, from this side activates the ionic currents, and this provides an electromechanical feedback. You may have diseases like arrhythmias uh, that are due to the altered patterns of electrical signal signals. Uh, you may have uh, a, a non-satisfactory diagnostic analysis made by doctors by simply looking at the electrocardiogram. Indeed, what you'd like to reconstruct is the volta voltage signal in the old heart, not only in the surface, say. Um, uh, there are several models that have been proposed in the past, uh, say, 20 years. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, successful is the so-called bi-domain equation. In this case, basically, the assumption is that the membrane is composed by gates that open and they form channels for the passage of ionic quantities like calcium, potassium, or others, say. Uh, this is a set of equations, uh, partially differential equations. These are advection, um, reaction diffusion equation uh, that depends on several quantities. The unknowns are UE and UI, which are the intra and extracellular electric potentials. Then you have the W, which is uh, a vector of ionic gates. Uh, and uh, you have this term here, this uh, reaction term H, that couples V and W. And uh, H is a reaction term that in a very simplified case, for instance, in the Fitzugnagumo model is a linear term in both uh, W, which is the gating variable, and V, which is the transmembrane potential. However, in more complex uh, models, uh, uh, like, for instance, the lua rudi model, uh, uh, this H can account for uh, as many as six different ions and 14 gates. And, uh, and, and this means that uh, uh, you have a, a set of ordinary differential equations uh, that are coupled with the system of, uh, of, uh, of partial differential equations. Um, uh, once you have the electric signal, how do you integrate it to determine the contraction of the heart? Well, here again, there are several approaches. Here is one that you have just proposed recently, but there are, there are many others. Uh, this is based on the so-called active strain formulation. This is uh, the configuration at rest. This is the actual configuration. And we pass through an intermediate configuration. You see this, the formation F is made as, uh, uh, by, by the sum of Fe. Uh, and FA. FA is the active deformation, this one. FE is the passive deformation. Here you solve an, elasto, uh, an elastodynamic problem, and uh, here you are splitting your FA as being uh, the sum of two-thirds plus one, say, 
um, uh, these are the fiber direction, uh, F, and these are the sheet, uh, sheet direction, say. And besides, you have this gamma coefficient that depends on V and depends on the ca calcium ions. Uh, the assumption here is the, the mechanics is hyperelastic, that the solid is behaving as an hyperelastic solid. It's orthotropic. You have an active strain decomposition as the one that I've been showing here. Uh, you use the Lagrangian formulation, and we use an old, uh, the, uh, the so-called old Zafan Ogden uh, model for, uh, for, the, uh, for the material, say. Now you have the couple problem. You have uh, the uh, two domain problem, the B domain problem, coupled with the uh, mechanical problem. And uh, in that case, you can ideally be able um, to uh, retrieve uh, uh, the interaction of, uh, to describe the interaction between the electricity and, uh, and the solid mechanics. What is lacking here is the presence of the fluid in the ventricle, and this is a further step that uh, should uh, have to be uh, undertaken. This is just a pictorial description of what I've been doing. Computing. Now you have your model, you have to solve it. The model is complex, and uh, how do we, uh, uh, how do we try to get rid of the complexity? Well, uh, the first approach is the so-called geometric multiscaling. Uh, well, if you, if you look at the whole uh, picture, you have uh, um, very big arteries like the aorta or the vena cava, and then you have uh, smaller arteries, which are still large, uh, and, and then you have arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you see the radius is very different. Uh, the Reynolds number, which is an indicator of the, uh, I would say, stability of the flow, is also very different. It could be in physiological condition of the order of 3,400 uh, in, the, in, the, in the aorta or in the vena cava, in the ascending aorta in the vena cava, down to 0 0.002 in the capillaries. Um, of course, also the uh, uh, structural mechanics problem of, of the different tissues are completely different. How do you account for all this uh, uh, richness or diversity, well, one possibility is to use three-dimensional models, for instance, the carotid artery in some special places, and to combine it with one-dimensional models for the main important, most important arteries and veins, say, order of 100 big arteries and big veins in our system, and then when you go down to the level of the peripheral resistances to the peripheral capillaries, we use a zero-dimensional model. Um, so you have 3D, 1D, and 0D. You have the interplay between uh, these uh, three kind of description. This is just a, a synthetic description of what is going on. You have 3D for Navistokes plus the elastodynamics. Uh, this is the uh, monster coupled system that I've shown before. Then uh, uh, when you go down to the 1D level, as we'll see, you have other equations just like in gas dynamics, uh, which is very funny or very surprising, mathematically speaking, because, I mean, we're very far from that kind of context, right? Uh, on the other end, Euler himself has developed the famous Euler equations for blood flow. This is quite surprising. In 1775, and he was describing the cylindrical vessels, and he, he provided these equations that um, account, of course, for the deformation, and this creates waves that propagate, and this explains the analogy with the, uh, with the gas dynamics. When you go to the level of capillaries, we are actually using the analogy with electrical circuits, and this is why we have a system of... Uh, ordinary differential equations. So we have 3D PDEs, 1D PDEs, and, uh, and 0D uh, PDEs, which means ordinary differential equations. You don't have any, any space variation anymore. So these are the other equations for the arteries. You see uh, you have Q, which is the flow rate. You have A, which is the uh, area of the vessel, which changes in time. Uh, this is the uh, continuity equation, conservation of mass. This is the... Uh, a continuity, a continuity of momentum, and this is just a constitutive law for closing the equation. You have to, set, you have to create a relationship between the pressure and, uh, and the arterial deformation. Say. Then you have 0D. This is just a simple example for a single circuit, a uh, single artery. You see, these are all the differential equations for the average pressure and the average flow rate in the i-th uh, circuit, say. And, of course, here we're talking about fluid dynamics. We are using electrical circuits, but you have to be careful that uh, what is a voltage in the electrical circuit here becomes a pressure. What is current becomes flow rate. Resistance is blood viscosity. Inductance is blood inertia. And, and capacitance is, is work compliance. So we have this interplay between different kinds of equations. And uh, Euler, as I was saying before, gave his equations only for a 
single artery, a single cylindrical vessel, but indeed here we have bifurcation, we have a variety of situations. How can you combine these different equations, order equations? Uh, here is a, one way. Uh, we, we set up a series of Euler equations for straight vessels or for curved vessels, say, that should join somewhere. And uh, here, at the junction, we enforce the continuity of the total pressure as well as the conservation of mass. There is no leaking, of course, in our system. Now, uh, you end up with a system that is well posed, mathematically speaking. You have a system of um, nonlinear hyperbolic equations uh, that have a unique solution. Luckily, we do not have uh, shock waves in our body, at least in physiological, physiological conditions. Um, there is not enough time and not enough space to develop shock waves because of uh, the fact that arteries are bending, are curved, and, uh, and because of the fact that you have uh, pulsatile uh, uh, inflow, which is dictated by the action of the heart. Uh, this is the one possible one-dimensional network that we're using. This is made of 55 arteries. But indeed, in our computation now, we, we have uh, uh, about 100 arteries. And this is just a picture of the simulation that you have when you solve one-dimensional uh, problems. We are solving uh, the other equations everywhere here. Uh, to uh, allow for uh, the pressure waves to uh, uh, propagate and, of course, the, the, for the flow of the fluid to propagate as well. And, indeed, uh, we solve uh, for the pressure, uh, the reformation of the artery, and, uh, and the flow rate. So here is uh, 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 the way we are treating the most part of, uh, of our system by one-dimensional models. Uh, this is a similar picture that shows the importance of the treatment of the peripheral, uh, of the peripheral vessels. Uh, here we use circuits to account for peripheral vessels. And, uh, and the quality of the result actually is improving quite substantially than just putting a resistance at the very end. Uh, so we are solving these uh, equations in uh, this uh, big portion of the domain, uh, of the computational domain of, of the circulatory system. We are solving about 100 arteries and veins. And then, uh, and then you have to couple this with uh, the three-dimensional model that we have seen before. So here is just a sketch. Uh, this is a three-dimensional artery, the carotid artery that we've seen before. And here is the 1D continuation where we solve the other equations. And, uh, and you, here we see that we don't have back reflection anymore. We would have back reflection if you just put boundary conditions here. These would be spurious uh, reflections uh, that are uh, due to the fact that you cannot guess the right physical boundary conditions at the end of the artery. So we couple with the one-dimensional uh, system, and by so doing, uh, we can get rid of the uh, wave reflections. Uh, that's another way you can use uh, one-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, uh, models. This is a completely different kind of context, actually. This is the brain. This is the circle of Willis, which is at the base of our brain. And uh, here we are solving uh, a problem of diffusion and, uh, and, uh, and convection of the oxygen in our brain, uh, we use one-dimensional models in the circle of Willis, so every piece of the circle of Willis is, is computed as being a one-dimensional model, solving the other equation that we have seen before, and solving one-dimensional advection diffusion equation for the propagation of oxygen, whereas in the external tissue, we solve a Darcy equation for the fluid. Uh, we consider these as being a porous medium, um, but of course you can use more sophisticated models like Navier-Stokes, and, uh, and we use a uh, a three-dimensional advection diffusion uh, equation for the propagation of, uh, uh, in this case, of the oxygen. Uh, of course, here, the tricky point at the mathematical level is the way you uh, match 1D with 3D. How do you communicate information between the 1D and the 3D? And we do it through delta functions that are carriers of uh, uh, fluxes of information. So I don't have time to elaborate on that but it's a completely different approach than the one that we have seen before for uh, the other equations. Uh, here is the same type of uh, simulation. Now what we see is the pressure field uh, under the action of the heartbeat, again, solving 1D problems in the artery and, uh, and 3D problems in the external, in the external tissue. Uh, how can you get rid of the complexity? I've shown the way uh, that you can operate at the geometrical level by using uh, one-dimensional and zero-dimensional problems. Uh, well, uh, uh, the uh, fluid structure interaction problem 
by itself is a very complex uh, type of problem. Uh, fluid structure means the coupling between the fluid and, 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 the, and, the, and the solid deformable structure, uh, like in the case of the artery. But of course, uh, fluid structure is not only in blood flow. There are other examples in which we have been working and using fluid structure algorithms uh, in aerodynamics, on the, in, uh, in, in ship engineering, or in uh, rowing, uh, uh, you see, hulls, uh, or in computing free surface and interaction with, uh, with a rigid body like a boat. Um, and, of course, there are many, many other contexts. Uh, here is the example in which you, you account for uh, uh, the interaction between the wind field uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the formable uh, uh, sails. Uh, here you see the pressure. Uh, so the color map refers to uh, uh, the, the pressure values. Uh, now, here we're looking at the hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that uh, we solve this free structure interaction problem, but you go up to the end uh, when uh, the, uh, the structure, the sails, are in equilibrium with the external flow field. In, uh, in this case, we are actually solving the dynamics, uh, namely the interaction, the dynamic interaction between uh, wind and, uh, and, uh, and sail deformation. Um, this is easily a very complex problem from the computational viewpoint because of the fact that we have to solve this uh, uh, 3D problem in the ALE context. Let me again uh, recall uh, for you here the problem you have the fluid, the structure, and the geometry. And uh, uh, how do we solve this problem? Uh, there, are, there is a very ample, uh, uh, ample literature on the way you can address fluid structure interaction problems. And, uh, and, and basically, there are two magic words, which are not actually very well uh, mathematically defined. But nonetheless, that's the way people resonate on uh, this type of, uh, of uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, one is monolithic, and the other is segregated. Uh, and, of course, there are then all possible uh, hybrid uh, uh, combinations between segregated and monolithic. Um, in, the, um, in the monolithic approach, you tend to solve all this problem at the same time, all together. You don't want to decouple the fluid from the structure, for instance. Uh, so the first thing is that you have to use, new, for instance, neutral linearization to linearize your problem. At every step of the neutral linearization, you have a... a, a a, a nonlinear, uh, I'm sorry, you have a linear coupled algebraic system. Uh, we use Krylov iterative methods, but then you need to use a, a parallel solver, and uh, the solver that we use is based on domain decomposition approach, and uh, we are actually developing domain decomposition preconditioners, which are based on a blockwise parallel Schwartz preconditioners. I have not time to elaborate on that, but if you are interested, of course, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, references. Um, uh, of course, you, you care about scalability when you use a parallel solver. And uh, here is an example where we show that uh, for a reasonable number of grid points, not, that, not too many actually, the, the degrees of freedom, uh, less than two millions, uh, you have this good scalability uh, uh, on uh, up to uh, 384 uh, cores. Uh, uh, this is on a, a Cray um, uh, T5 machine. And, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, then we lose scalability because of the fact that we are using uh, uh, Schwartz methods without course, um, um, without a course component. And uh, we are about to introduce the course component. The course component is there to, uh, to get a perfectly scalable algorithm. Um, now, uh, the system is still very big. How can you, again, get rid of this complexity? That's another possible way. Uh, it's to try to reduce the dimension. What does that mean? Well, it means that instead of solving the three-dimensional problem everywhere, we just solve a two-dimensional problem on the endothelium interface. We lamp the whole information at the interface, and, uh, and then you solve this problem on a manifold. You go from a 3D to the 2D. So we go from a set of 3D degrees of freedom, uh, finite term degrees of freedom, for instance, to a 2D set of degrees of freedom. Uh, and you do that, let's say in algebraic terms, this would, uh, uh, yeah, in algebraic terms, this would mean uh, uh, using the uh, uh, Schur complement. Uh, here you use the stack of operator, which is the differential counterpart of the Schur complement. All right. Um, the, uh, there is another way to reduce complexity, and is to use the free form deformation. You describe your, uh, uh, this is for a bypass configuration, you describe your uh, structure as being, uh, um, uh, you see, embedded uh, into a rectangular domain in 2D or in a, on a, on a parallel people domain, then uh, you transform this rectangle in a, in, a, in, a, in a square. We use control points, very few control points. 
you use a suitable map, which is a linear combination of Bernstein polynomials in this case, you deform your control point, and then by applying this map, the inverse of this map, you retrieve the actual transform uh, form of your, of your interface. And, uh, and, that, and this uh, uh, brings a, a very important change in the algorithm. This is the classical free structure algorithm. Here you have an extra step, which is the parametric free form deformation. Uh, then you have, uh, in this case, the use of reduced basis to get rid of the parametric dependence. And uh, in a very simple case, you see that the saving is quite, quite remarkable. The saving in terms of uh, the uh, dimension of the system is quite, quite impressive. It's a couple of order of magnitude, say. Applications. Uh, well, there are infinitely many applications. Here is just a selection of a few possible applications. The first one is to, for a better understanding of the physiology, uh, this is still the ascending aorta. And now this is a heartbeat. You will see this is time. You go from 0 to 1.8. These are two heartbeats. You see the streamlines from one side. You see the particle displacement on the other side. And you see the deformation of the external artery here. Now this is now the diastolic part. You see you have a kind of uh, calm situation. Now you have an act, another systolic peak very soon and you see the uh, evolution of uh, the streamlines and also the deformation of the, of the external artery that is becoming more, more important. And uh, we have, uh, now we are almost at the uh, second uh, diastolic phase for the second heartbeat, and, uh, and of course, uh, then you will continue in a periodic, more or less periodic manner. Uh, compliant versus rigid walls, this is another debate that is ongoing. Uh, well, the results that we have are actually showing that uh, in this specific case, uh, if you take a rigid, not non-compliant uh, artery, uh, the wall shear stresses are much overestimated uh, than with respect to the, uh, to the, to the compliant. And uh, if you look at the pictures of the flow rate, you actually see that the curves are completely different, substantially different in amplitude and also in, in phase. Um, flow in the iliac artery, this is another physiological, let's say computation on a physiological uh, situation. Now you have a bifurcation, and again you see the same quantities that we have seen, uh, that we have seen before. Uh, now uh, you can, of course, account for surgical treatment. This is a bypass graft. Uh, the abdominal aorta and uh, down to the femoral artery. And here you have a design uh, problem, how to design this femoral uh, bypass uh, uh, graft. And of course, you have to see the way the uh, uh, circulation develops and uh, the, the, you have to see the way the, the flow is perturbed. And on the basis of that, you can try to find out an quote, quote, optimal form um, of your uh, bypass graft uh, using optimal shape design. I'm about to finish prosthetic devices. Uh, here there is a plenty of possible, again, simulation. Uh, this is a, a cannula for a, a ventricular assisted device. And, uh, and of course, uh, here we are just applying this external cannula. Uh, this is downstream the heart uh, flow ejection because the ventral is not working properly and it's extremely critical to design this cannula and the way uh, the, uh, the flow rate is dictated here. And, uh, and, uh, and finally, let me, uh, this is still the, the, the previous uh, application, and finally let me, let me show this application to directly release from stents. A stents are uh, struts, metallic struts that you put in the artery to uh, remove the occlusion to restore the circulation. And uh, uh, typically, you put a coating uh, of polymeric material on the stent, and this coating uh, of this polymer releases uh, uh, drugs uh, to uh, counteract the inflammatory procedure. It's very important to design the right stent. First of all, it's very important to simulate the way the stents are uh, implanted. And this is, again, free structure interaction. This is a balloon that is inflated and that is deflated. So this is a uh, large deformation and large stresses. And, and this is the way the substance is released from the stent in the lumen. Uh, this is the concentration. And uh, it will be eventually washed out completely from, from the flow. Um, and, uh, and then what is more important to simulate what is going on in the arterial wall. We'll see in a while the way the uh, drug is absorbed and, uh, and distributed within the arterial wall. And this is the beneficial part of, uh, of the process. And of course, there are several issues here. How do you describe this uh, problem? And you use a multi-scale uh, model, uh, which is a micro, a meso, and, and micro. And then uh, and here is the, the diffusion of the concentration 
in the artery. And, uh, and another aspect is the way you design stents in a better way uh, in order to be more effective. Uh, and, um, and this is, uh, well, I have many other, perhaps few others, but I think I'm going to stop here because I'm uh, uh, right at the end of my time. Thank you very much. So thanks very much for this really uh, very fascinating talk. Um, for the sake of the coffee break, uh, we should limit the number of questions to maybe one or two. So are there questions or remarks? It looks like there is a great deal of visualization aspect to your research. Do you, do you use standard tools or you develop things in-house uh, for, for this purpose? We, we are not specialists on that. We try to, uh, to stick on the algorithmic part and the modeling part, so we tend to use standard tools. This is, uh, these are uh, open source tools, actually. So one more question. So how would you fit this model to the patient-specific simulation? Uh, well, of course, that's a very good question. As I was saying before, uh, it, uh, this is uh, probably the, the most uh, difficult part. Uh, I've shown an example using data simulation. This is one way, for instance, right? When you have data that you can get from MRI in time, uh, then you can use them to uh, um, compare with what you get in your simulation and uh, to uh, tune up the different parameters in your model to better fit with the data. That's one way, when you have real data from the patients. Uh, that's a very lucky situation, actually, because, you know, taking this data is, very, is kind of a very invasive procedure. Uh, if you don't have data, you try to uh, make sure your model responds properly to the, uh, say, benchmark situations. But when you have data, you can use data simulation or you can use just uh, comparison according to different norms. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.